Hello, happy Earth Day and welcome to our virtual panel, Upgrade Available, Live and Illustrated with Julia Christensen, Aria Dean, and Jessica Gambling. I'm Joel Furry, Program Director of the Art and Technology Lab at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Our program provides financial and in-kind support to artist projects that engage emerging technology. For more information on our program, please visit LACMA.org or uh, slash lab or email lab at LACMA.org. I know this is a tough time for many folks out there tonight. For those of you who are struggling, we appreciate you joining us. I'd like to thank our um, audiovisual and education teams for their support in bringing this event to fruition as well. Julia Christensen is an artist and writer whose current project, Upgrade Available, has received the LACMA Art and Technology Lab Award, as well as a Guggenheim Fellowship and a grant from Creative Capital. Her new book, Upgrade Available, will be available in the spring of 2020 via Dancing Foxes Press, and a solo exhibition of the associated artwork will be imminently on view at Art Center College of Design. Arya Dean is an artist, writer, and curator based in New York and Los Angeles. She is an editor and curator at Rhizome. Jessica Gambling has been the museum archivist at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art since the archive was established in 2010. There, she is responsible for all description, access, reference, and outreach activities for the institutional archives, as well as records management at the museum. Before joining LACMA, she was an archivist at the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens, as well as the Los Angeles Public Library. Julia will start tonight's program with a brief introduction and uh, will then engage with our panelists. We will be wrapping up the uh, evening with about 10 minutes of Q&A. And I'd like to remind folks that you can ask questions using Zoom webinars Q&A feature in the lower toolbar. If you have questions of a technical nature, you can ask them throughout the event, but please withhold questions for Julia and our panelists until during the Q&A period at the end of the program. Finally, a reminder that we will be recording tonight's event. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Julia Christensen, Aria Dean, and Jessica Gambling. Thanks, Joel. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here this evening. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little about Upgrade Available, uh, which is a series of art, of art projects and now a book about what I call upgrade culture, the perceived constant need to upgrade our electronics and recordable media and how it impacts our experience of time. Okay, so I am going to share my screen now with you. Uh, just a minute. Okay, um, so the project is divided into four distinct time scales, and the book begins in the shortest time frame, um, which I call technology time. The short cycles of time between the upgrades we perform to our software and our hardware, technology time. The project began on my first trip to India uh, when two important things happened. I visited my first e-waste processing plant, uh, and when I returned, my computer was stolen, and I had not backed it up yet, so the only documentation I have from that trip was on my iPhone. Um, my iPhone was filled with the casual, seemingly random images I had snapped along the way, Pictures of flowers and bugs, odd items in the market, meals, curious signage, videos taken from the open window of moving trains, of holy cows blocking traffic, of women on motorcycles with babies wrapped in their backs. I don't have any of the more calculated documentation as it had all been taken on my professional camera and stored in neat files on my stolen computer, but I have scads of videos of street scenes in that vertical nine by 16 iPhone ratio, a now familiar format and vernacular. Those images pervade my impressions of that trip. The loss of my computer's memory bank altered my own memory. The juxtaposition of seeing the e-waste on the ground and then having my memory impacted by the loss of my computer led me to investigate the clash of these timeframes, that of technology consumption and long-term memory. 
These videos here are from a project called Burnouts, which emphasizes the difference in time scales uh, between us, the mappers, and the mapped, in this case, the cosmos. These animations of constellations are no longer included on official star maps because mostly we can no longer see the constellations due to light pollution. So from there, I started thinking about lifetime and how we store our memories throughout our lifetime. There's me on my first birthday. Uh, this was a Super 8 film that was then transferred to um, a DVD player and many forms of digital movies after that. I started photographing uh, the collections of friends and neighbors of their personal media collections, many of which were obsolete, so they'll never um, they'll never see them again, they'll never uh, watch them again, but they're still important to them. So then I began to think about um, how this uh, impacts the scale of an institution like the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, I began uh, working with the archives there when I started my fellowship at the Arc, uh, Art and Tech Lab. How can we maintain a cultural narrative for the course of multiple human lifetimes when the upgrade is always available? Technology time runs interference to um, saving thing, things for the scale of institutional time. I photographed and worked with the ephemera in the institutional archive, which contains every imaginable media format. And I also started to uh, investigate institutional architecture. Um, I began to photograph absolute uh, technology embedded in the current and past LACMA buildings as a way of thinking about how the technology of today will play out over time when the new LACMA buildings are complete. Um, I thought this was a good time to um, look at that as the LACMA buildings are being upgraded. Um, another part of the, the LACMA fellowship um, was an introduction to scientists and engineers at design companies and technology companies around the Los Angeles area. And I started a dialogue with scientists and engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab who were thinking about space time. Um, how can we envision technology that can explore the expanse of space and time and potentially travel light years away from us when we're dealing with the material scales of technology time. Um, during this, uh, this ongoing conversation that I've had with them, I've worked with a group at JPL called the A-Team, with whom I developed ideas including a 200-year operational spacecraft concept, as well as a communication system that augments living trees to act as a kind of mega antenna that can communicate with our 200-year spacecraft allowing technology time to transcend, hopefully, to space time. Uh, and here is a model of that, um, that antenna uh, on Mount Wilson a couple months ago. You can see LA in the background there. So this is the basic um, sort of arc of the narrative of the artwork uh, that I've been making for years and, um, and the book. Uh, I had traveled around the world to witness the aggregate of our electronic trash being buried in the crust of our planet. I had asked neighbors to dig through their basements to tell me about how they preserved their memories in dusty boxes of magnetic tape, warping from water and wear. I had transported boxes of ephemera from a museum to an academic gorilla lab, worrying with technology old enough to negotiate it. And in the end, I found myself at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab where I found my answer to technology time in trees. They were here all along. So yes, we have a book that tells this story in much more detail. Uh, there's the front cover and the back cover. Uh, the book is printed and in boxes at the port of Spain waiting to be shipped across the, across the ocean. Uh, but here's a quick flip for you um, through the book. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop my screen share here for a minute. And uh, organize a little bit. Um, 
Okay, so now we're back to my desktop. Um, so I uh, we're going to use this text file here as kind of a chalkboard to help guide us um, through the conversation tonight. So in terms of technology time, um, some of the important uh, uh, sort of themes that we'll talk about are how we encode our electronics and our recordable media with our memory and our identity and our legacy. Um, uh, in terms of lifetime, uh, we might talk a bit about how the image um, acts as a social object um, in our networked environment uh, as something that we share versus an archival object, something that we save. Um, maybe we'll also talk a little bit about um, platforms and how different platforms and apps inform the way uh, that we save things. Um, institution time, we will talk a bit about, um, you know, how upgrade culture um, uh, impacts uh, institutions. Um, we'll talk a bit about scale, um, fidelity, uh, the record time cycle, life cycle. Um, and then uh, in terms of space time, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the um, tree antenna and how that came about. So um, I think the first person to join me is going to be Aria Dean. Are you here, Aria? Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, so yeah, I guess um, we can, you know, kind of dive in here um, in terms of memory, identity, and legacy. And I'd love to hear any thoughts or questions that um, you might be having in your own work related to um, related to these these issues. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that yeah, I think I've been thinking about these things for a while in my work, um, probably starting with beginning when I was studying with you at Oberlin, um, probably a lot of it started there. Um, but I think that the question of memory and identity and legacy in particular, I mean, I guess for me, it sort of, I it brings up sort of a question about like um, prosthetics or like a memory prosthesis in a way um, and sort of, I guess I'm interested in thinking about, um, you know, as we interface or our, our social experiences and also our self understanding gets mediated by these technological objects. Um, yeah, I mean, what you were talking about before, like loading more and more of our memories into, um, into, yeah, into these objects, like what does that do to our ability to remember for ourselves um, or, or how we sort of do that work? Um, and I guess then like thinking about also, I guess something in my work that I thought about too is the sort of um, potential like arcing towards a more collective memory or um, collective identity, like, you know, defining things more in relation than um, for themselves. But I guess I wonder like, yeah, for you, do you have more thoughts on like, I guess the historical, like historical, sh historically shifting um, way that we, you know, approach memory or like, uh, and identity in that respect, or I guess, yeah, contemporary and the going to the future, how we approach those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, one thing that I think um, is really uh, pertinent that uh, I stumbled across when throughout my research is this idea of transactive memory. Um, it's a function of our memory um, in which we delegate certain kinds of memory to people around us, like um, maybe your mom always remembers um, your cousin's birthdays and reminds you uh, to send them a note or something. So you just never remember that yourself. You know, we all have these social systems of, of memory and certain kinds of memory that people keep for us. Um, and there are these really interesting studies that are that show that uh, we're developing these transactive memory networks with our electronics too. So, um, you know, our phones, our bookmarks, our, um, you know, our hard drives, etc. 
um, all become these kind of, we offload cognitive uh, space onto these prosthetic sort of, um, you know, things that are becoming, I mean, they're extensions of us um, in a way, which makes them very complicated, um, especially when they become trash. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, then people are kind of like, what do they, what do we do with them? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think you mentioned something to me in our ongoing chat that we had um, going about this a while ago. You got rid of an iPhone recently, or you got a new phone, mm -hmm. and like the old phone had thousands of pictures on it. And you know, we've we've had this experience. Like, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also yeah, this sort of like tension between yeah, with like that sort of thing. It's like these images become like these sort of like deadened objects in that respect, like they no longer, I mean, in a sense, almost they almost cease to function as images, let's say images that are on an old phone that are just sitting there as files. Like they don't, if they're not, it's like a, if a tree falls sort of thing, almost like if they don't get shown, it's a digital image still, yeah, materially it's there, but it's not quite um, the same. And, and also like, yeah, with regard to this offloading of memory and the intersection with that, I think it's also like, both of these things, yeah, sort of this, the tension between like data and let's, you know, in terms of like, let's say larger memory, like between data and like archiving. And, um, you know, if you have a, you, know, you can call all this data, but you're not, but you know, if a computer system is doing it, like what sorts of meaning making structures, like algorithmically, let's say, is it actually employing versus like, and how does that match up or, um, you know, uh, like miss sort of a human meaning making um, structures. And then as well, I guess, like the correlate is with images, then, you know, if an image is sitting on a phone that's out of use, it's just data, I suppose, in a way. And then if it's active and it becomes activated by um, entrance into some sort of like social sphere, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like um, a tree, if a tree falls in the woods, you know, mm -hmm. and if an image is on an old iPhone, yeah. yeah, it's like a digital, digital metaphysical question, kind of like. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, it's also um, related to, we've talked about, you know, time, uh, not as a linear construct, but as um, something that's happening as sort of uh, an endless collection of moments that are, that are happening. Um, and uh, how various kinds of electronic software and um, uh, electronic components kind of have their different frames of this of time. Um, mm -hmm. And in your work recently, you've been looking at how non-electronic objects um, function in this way too. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll share the Venturi column here, and you could talk a little bit about um, this piece as related to and sculpture and, mm -hmm. and time. Yeah, so um, I mean, I guess like, yes, yeah, so that piece is a um, replica of a column designed by Robert Venturi that's at Oberlin College, um, and it sits between, it's kind of like the joint, operates as a joint almost between um, the original 1917 Cass Gilbert designed Oberlin or Allen Art Museum building that has like neoclassical ionic columns. Um, oh, I should say that the original column's name, or it's like ionic, I, I, ionic, ironic, sorry, it's like always, always gets confusing. But um, anyway, but so basically it's, um, yes, yeah, so these original ionic columns are there and then there's a Venturi like 1970 something um, addition that was built on, on the building. And so the column sits between those two things and at Oberlin, of course, if you're an art student, you cross this pathway like pretty often. Um, so th at the show at Green Aftali, we created a replica of, a to scale replica of that column. Um, and the only difference is that, you know, slightly different wood, it's in a different place and it's painted white to match the Green Aftali um, space. And I was interested, I guess, in sort of, I guess how this object kind of, to me, perfectly folds time over on itself in a way that I've been quite interested in in my own work for a while, the sort of like accumulative um, fashioning of time rather than like a linear sectioned off sort of capitalist Western time, but sort of time that's collecting and collecting and, you know, almost growing in a way. So it, you know, it takes this and, you know, object from antiquity, the classic on a column and takes its revival, its neoclassical architecture, and then Venturi doubles both of those things over on themselves and creates a postmodern sort of ironic riff on that structure. And then 
I then take that and replicate it elsewhere. And I think, um, yeah, I think like for me, it's also kind of deals with, yeah, so thinking about this object that kind of sits at this weird intersection of time and kind of perfectly is suspended in time such that it sort of sits outside of time almost in a way. Um, and I think it goes with a lot of things I've been thinking about about sculpture overall. Like I was speaking, I actually remembered as we were talking about this before, like um, I didn't come up with this, but like I was speaking to um, the artist Mayo Thompson and he was, he referred to sculpture as a, he's like, it's a time-based medium. It's like, it's sculpture is only about time. And I was like, yeah, I think that's kind of what I've been thinking about is that, you know, sculpture in its complete like presencing in a given moment is about time and that it's like, okay, you're only right here right now with this thing. And of course it can change, even if it's changing, you know, is a sculpture that's alive or whatever, it's still just when you approach it, it is what it is right then. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and then I think also it does sort of tangentially have a lot to do with like digital, like a digital materialism in certain ways, sort of say like versioning a thing, um, which was something that, you know, I was very interested in or have been interested in for a while as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it's also related, I think, to um, the internet. And, uh, you know, the internet is all about time in very much the same way, but maybe the other side of the, the coin, you know? I mean, it's, it's all about right now, and it's about the connection. Oh, I'll, um, I'll bring up the, uh, the, um, the net art. Uh, diagram from the MTAA piece. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk about this a little bit, but but yeah. it's all about um, yeah. I mean, kind of what you just said about sculpture. We could um, cut that quote out and then paste it in a paragraph about the internet, and it would mean kind of the same thing, but like mm -hmm. totally different too. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think. Or sorry, um, I think yeah. Also with the internet, I think it's like we talked to you about the sort of like you know, we've in a lot of ways viewed the internet as like a progressive timeline and that, you know, it's like platform, your interaction of platforms and, you know, the technology is only getting more robust, et cetera. But I think something that's interesting, especially in this current moment, is um, the ways in which, at least for myself personally, my experience of the internet during quarantine, um, I feel like the internet is also looping back on itself to like a sort of late 2000s, early 2010s sort of moment where, you know, when I was growing up and was like on blog, like, you know, reading music blogs and stuff and just, you know, I think people are interfacing with the internet in a way that for a lot of people feels very nostalgic right now, which I'm not entirely certain of why that is, but I think that it's interesting the sort of concentric, like looping kind of timeline. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, uh, yeah, and that's sort of the presentness and the right nowness of the internet. There are these different timescales, and I think we're also watching another timescale that's sort of like, like as we're interacting with right now, the sort of event-based internet, uh, which is something that at, at Rhizome in my capacity as a curator and editor, we're starting to think a lot about like live stream and, you know, Zoom panels and sort of the super, super hyper presentness of the internet right now in relationship to yeah. like the platform feed as very linear and things like that. Right, totally. Um, which I think with the MTAA thing, kind of like that model of how things work on the internet is actually really useful because it's able to encompass all of these different ways of interacting, like this artwork from, I don't remember the exact year, but late 90s, I think. Um, 97, and it suggests, I think. 97, yeah. It suggests that, um, you know, the, this, the art, or let's say the art or whatever the activity is on the internet, it's not on the screen, it's not in the code, it really is the performative coming together of like, you know, relation, I suppose. Um, so, mm -hmm. which can kind of span all these different time scales. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's also related to, um, you know, what you're saying about how um, time kind of folds in on itself for it's this um, concentric sort of cyclical um, thing that's happening on the internet because, um, because in a way, even though it is this dynamic thing that changes and keeps going in a kind of somewhat linear fashion, it is also still so much about what's happening right now in terms of the connection that it's kind of the same thing over and over mm -hmm. again, you know, mm -hmm. um, with just like a different app or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Uh, so we have a couple more minutes before Jessica comes on. Do you want to um, talk a little bit about your um, experience with saving the internet or archiving the internet in terms of um, the net art anthology you worked on at Rhizome? Yeah, sure. Um, so net art anthology was this 
online exhibition that kind of unfolded over the course of two and a half to three years um, and culminated in a, a physical show at the New Museum in early 2019. Um, and basically it tells the story of net art over a hundred different works. So it's kind of, it is just, it's like the anthology film archive model of choosing like sort of landmark moments in the field. Um, and yeah, so basically that MTAA graphic is sort of emblematic of our approach to art archiving, um, which really relies on this idea of art as a performative like endeavor. So our approach is that like, we've tried to create the, approximate the conditions that one might have originally viewed a given work and so let's say if it's a browser-based work from like like that Ole Lilina piece that's on the screenshot like you know it's a browser-based work for the 90s like it would have probably been seen in a specific you know browser um, with specific you know technical limitations at, the, at that given time so we you know created like nested browser windows that then and you could like um uh yeah you can like then interact with the work and we really want it want to preserve the like liveness again of experiencing work on the internet so like a, there are certain situations in which we can only show documentation because the work is lost or because you know just certain technical limitations um but our goal is to really lean into like the performativity of the medium and 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 the and a user orientation as well like sort of like okay so as a user how would you what would it feel like to see this work um when it originally was made um and so it's interesting and i think like and a lot of that then has it means a lot of engagement with artists and a lot of engagement with you know, like deep dives into like weird technical histories. Um, and, you know, and then also like even geopolitically um, dealing with works from like the global South or like, you know, like Eastern Europe from a certain period of time, like again, like, you know, like Russian net art from like the nineties or something like that's right. a super specific um, geopolitical context that then also limits how we can show it now. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting and for me it's been an interesting and like, intimate experience of an internet also an internet that predates my own engagement with the medium being quite young so i've gotten to like understand things that i wouldn't you know like how flash actually you know operates like that kind of right, stuff right um, so yeah yeah awesome um great okay well um i think that it is time for me to um to open up jessica's little window over here. And um, we'll talk again during the panel in a few minutes. Okay, thanks, Aria. Okay, and Jessica. Hi. Sharing for a minute. Hi, how are you? Oh, good, excellent in adjusted terms. Right, <laughs> yes. Um, okay, well, um, we are going to talk a little bit about institutions. Um, right. I have learned so much from you over the last few years um, uh, about, you know, uh, the sort of challenges and um, and exciting possibilities of um, of archival operations within an institution like LACMA. Uh, in a digital networked um, age. Uh, of course, this is a huge conversation and um, I'm so glad that we have had the chance in the past to have many of these conversations at length. Um, but I just thought a few of the sort of key topics that we could talk about here um, include, uh, you know, the scale. You're not saving just like one document, you're saving like hundreds all the time. I mean, when we're talking about Twitter, it's like, you know, thousands of tweets. Um, yeah. Fidelity, fidelity um, over longevity or are fidelity and longevity the same thing? I mean, something might be able to last for a long, long time, but not be a very good um, uh, replication of an object or a document, uh, but maybe that's fine. Uh, and you mentioned the record life cycle. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to hear about, I'd love to hear about this stuff. Thank um, you. So maybe, maybe we could start with this idea of the record life cycle that you brought up. Sure. I wanted to bring this up because I think it really uh, ties in well with the ideas of sort of different types of time. So in the records life cycle, um, there's kind of, there's, there are a couple of different models, but the one that's sort of the most traditional is the life cycle where it starts with the creation of a record, goes through a situation where there's sort of this high use, 
And then after that, it sort of drops down to very low use. And then after that comes a period of time when it's archived and has another sort of peak that goes up with use related to researching the past. So um, I'm in this very unusual, well, no, it is not unusual, but it felt uncomfortable to me at first where I'm both working at the creation portion of the records life cycle and then also in that archived uh, research portion, the end of the records life cycle. So when I first started working at LACMA, I was in this position where people were asking me advice on creation. And as an archivist, um, at least when I was learning to be an archivist, um, there was a lot of talk about like you don't influence the creation of the record. That's not for you. But at the same time, I'm at work and people are saying, Jessica, how do I file these records? Which sounds very, which is very, very basic. But at the same time, it's like, if I have advice to give, that's going to mean the record survives. It feels, uh, it's, it, it seems a lot, a lot less correct to uh, decline to be of assistance. Um, but yeah, it is a very interesting situation where you're sort of like looking at history and sometimes you're looking at history of the institution, but you're also looking at um, sort of the lifetime as well, because you can see things over the lifetime of individuals who work within the institution and all of these things sort of accumulate and sort of snowball into this um, large sprawling archival record that becomes, um, can be quite daunting to manage, in my opinion. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so um, I think maybe can you, yeah. Can you give us a specific example of like, say, um, you know, one specific document or media format or something and how that has played out in this uh, record life cycle sort of model or um, trajectory? Oh, sure. Oh, let me see. I might have to think of a, a, a fictional example. Um, I might right. not be able to think of the perfect real world one. So uh, one example might be, um, say you have a memo. Okay, so at LACMA, these are sort of iconic if you're in the institution if, for a while. There are these sort of half page yellow memos with um, a red Los Angeles County Museum of Art on the top. Um, the memo could say any number of things. It can talk about uh, purchases, just any old thing. Um, so what happens with this memo is it has a period of high use. Obviously, there's going to be lots of copies of this memo. It's going to be sent out to everybody in the institution. Everybody's going to read it. That's the creation and then this high level of use. And usually memos are, you know, of course, uh, addressing something that's happening right in the now, something right away that's going to occur. It has a short lifespan of high use. And right after that, it drops off. You file the memo or throw it away. Um, and you're not going to look at it again. It, it has no uh, relevance to your day to day. You don't need to refer to it after a very short period of time. Um, now, what happens is I arrive at the sort of archival portion of the records life cycle. There's probably a very specific vocabulary word for that, and I've forgotten it, um, where I find the memo again and I process it and make it accessible to new people to use it in a different way. So it depends on what's in the memo, but it could be something um, uh, from time to time, the memos include things that are very interesting, like, like I don't know, to me, uh, can be very, very interesting. So for example, memos related to travel for artists, for our art and technology program in the late 1960s, early 1970s, where we have, for example, the record of like, oh, go pick up, you know, John Chamberlain from the airport and drive him to X, Y, and Z, you know, aircraft manufacturer in order for them to begin their work there. So, you know, this memo was like just to make sure somebody meets someone at the airport, you know, high use, and then, or to make sure that, you know, the airline ticket gets purchased. But then in the end, for years, for I don't know, how many years is that now? Almost 50 years. And at the end, then it comes back to me, and then it's high use again, where people are using this to document the art making activities and a certain very important program to our institution, and maybe to the careers of the artists that were involved in that program. So that's the sort of um, fictionalized account. It yeah. could definitely happen. I believe there are examples of that in collections that I have. But yeah, there's an, that, that's a very specific example. Yeah. Okay. Um, I thought this would be a good time to bring up, these are some of my photographs of the archives. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think something that uh, I've learned about the archival system um, that you've explained to me is that um, uh, archiving about an event or about a, a time period or an artist, it's almost like a cloud. Um, 
And very often that cloud contains documents in various media formats and maybe over long periods of time, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and so saving any one moment is actually like saving a kind of wily cloud of moments. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, I and, really, oh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, you, you've also mentioned before that, you know, at the, at the heart of the archival um, intention is to order things chronologically. And, um, you know, time, it's important to see what came after what in order to make sense of context. Um, and this kind of technology time, you know, never ending upgrade seems to run directly, uh, direct interference into that process. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you try to make order of time in a um, technological system that uh, evades uh, time or <laughs> runs against time? Um, well, chronology is um, a very traditional and a really common way to organize things because, you know, things happen one after the other. Um, and that happens to be, you know, how people file things, but it's not the only way. So um, original order is something that's very important as a concept archivally is what order did the creator um, put these materials in? Um, and then also, if there is no order that the creator put them in uh, to try and create some kind of order out of it. So something that's sort of interesting about these materials specifically is that a lot of them were not organized in the way that we like that I showed them to you in. It's like they're organized by, um, well, they weren't physically organized, but the way that we determined this was how are they labeled. So um, they're labeled by project, for example. Um, so you try to um, you try to be very flexible. So you can't really push things into an organization that does not already exist. You're gonna, it's not it it. Almost every time that I have attempted to do so, you run into a lot of exceptions and you run into places where your system simply does not function anymore, where it breaks down. So it's mm -hmm. best to just sort of like go with what the creator um, did themselves. And a lot of times that's very organic. Um, and for some archivists, I feel like they may not enjoy uh, letting those things fall within gate as much as I do. But it's also a matter of labor, like how much time do you have to totally reorganize something? Um, and then there's also this idea that sort of in the digital age, you can use metadata to sort of break things out of their chronology. So you don't have to physically thumb through um, boxes and folders of files necessarily if things are existing individually as digital um, surrogates. So there's kind of an idea of that where things can be divorced from their context. But like you were saying, that can be very confusing. So it could be possible, like, you know, when I talk about my collections, it's very difficult to describe things individually, mostly because of volume, but also individually, they don't have a lot of value a lot of the time. I mean, information is normally the, in the crux of what I've got here. It's not really, um, as an artifact, they're not as interesting as they are informationally. And if you divorce one item from the rest of its sort of cohort, it automatically sort of becomes, um, uh, it sort of, de it, it becomes less easy to understand. It's more difficult to interpret what's going on with that record, which kind of relates to that sort of cloud analogy that I like to make where it's like, you can't find, you can't really pinpoint something. You're always looking for like the treasure for the individual item. But in my sort of model, um, I find like, you know, um, you're not able to organize everything. The researcher or the archivist has to sort of um, find the related um, materials around it. Um, you have to kind of go two steps away in order to sort of intuit what the center of your interest, your, in, your, your core um, inquiry is. Um, so I think I might have gone a little bit far off of my original point, but I did want to adjust sort of that um, that sort of cloud analogy there, because I think the uncertainty yeah. of it is something that's very um, striking about mm -hmm. archives and something that people don't um, don't realize that it's not about um, it's not about final truths. Right. Sometimes right. it's about uncertainty, and it's about a lot yeah. of uncertainty. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, that's um, really, I think, at the heart of a lot of the conversations that we've had and my own research into this is uh, that, yeah, archives are mistakenly seen a lot of times as the end point of something when yeah. actually they are sandboxes um, through which we can reinterpret and reinterpret um, uh, history and the future. Uh, at least that is uh, how how we hope uh, they they can act right as um, as places to be accessed and reinterpreted. Right, exactly. And for um, like the archives for myself, like working in the museum, sort of the um, the museum model. And I I'm I'm positive that there are um, curators like on our in our webinar, etc. But in the museum model, it's very interpretive, where they're really giving you a lot of guidance for the items that you are experiencing within the museum most of the time, where it's like, this is an object and the curator has chosen to show this object in uh, context with these others. They create the wall card, they give you text to understand it. But for the archives, um, I don't do that, or I try very hard not to, where it's like, here are the records. I would like this skull, like you as a researcher to examine these and um, come to your own conclusions about them. And I think that's especially important to try to do as an institutional archivist because I am sort of an agent of whatever it is of the thing being studied. So um, obviously I'm going to have a certain bias and I'm trying not to, well, I don't really try not to let my bias creep in, but I try to make it super obvious. I'm like, listen, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt. I, I don't, I wouldn't mean to mislead anybody, but I don't, I mean, something's bound to occur. You know, I'm bound to have a certain point of view, especially like um, we're talking about sort of like that sort of a lifetime within the institution time where people are looking at records possibly for people who might still work at the museum or even if they don't work at the museum, I've been there so long that these are people I know personally. Mm -hmm. So I may become protective over these people who are my colleagues. Um, I can't think of anything any of my colleagues has done that's embarrassing or they would need protection from, but, but, you know, you never know, like maybe this memo is full of typos and you'd be embarrassed for so-and-so who, who wrote it. Um, and I've tried to sort of punt that, like you try to uh, move it along by being like the next generation will do it, or these should be closed for various reasons. Uh, according to our access policy. And part of that is, you know, ethically important and also, um, ways to manage your time and your resources. But also for me, I'm like, I don't, I don't feel like I can process the records of somebody I know personally. Yeah, or, um, yeah. and I feel weird doing it for um, records. Like, I'd be curious to see how I could do, um, process the records or describe the records for um, events that I'm intimately involved with as well. Like people right. doing like a family archive. I feel like, I'm like, oh, that's weird. Like I have a family archive here in this room with me in a closet. Yeah. And it's a little weird, I'm like, well, how am I going to tackle this? I'm like, it's, do I, I what if I just prior, I'm like, I obviously want to look at pictures of my, my grandma the most, but this isn't about my grandma. She's one member of this family. So right. I think it's the same thing. Like I'm personally attached to this collection, which is the collection of the institution, the institution that employs me, the institution I've worked at for a really long time. And it's personally very important to me. So um Trying to manage yeah. that can be difficult, but I do try to sort of like, I like having the excuse of like the next, the next generation, the next archivist. Right. And there must right. be another archivist after me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, this is all super interesting. Um, and we should continue to talk about this stuff um, with our panelists. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a minute. Um, there's Joel, and I think Aria is going to come back. Hi. Hello. Hi, All right. Aria. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for a really engaging uh, conversation thus far. And now we begin the Q&A section of our event. Um, just to get us started, we have one question here um, that we can kind of just uh, get things going with. Um, how do we zoom out to understand the shorter time frames of technology time and lifetime in the contexts of institutional time and space time? Yeah, I mean, that is um, a, a great question that's kind of at the heart of um, the research that I've been doing um, for the last almost 10 years. I mean, it's, it's 
harder and harder for us as a public maybe to imagine um, a longer scale time frame because um, uh, the sort of short time cycles that dominate our lives with technology, but also uh, with media, government, uh, their, their, you know, academia, they're, all of these sort of social structures are based on fairly quick cycles of time, which, which um, makes it harder for us to plan for the long-term future. And um, so my um, sort of questioning and writing and the work throughout this process has been to, um, to figure out how to, if not um, get from one time scale to the next, how to kind of bridge between their um, sort of operations and, um, and think about it as all kind of the same thing, really. I mean, rather than thinking about them separately, um, thinking about time, rather than thinking of it in terms of linear time, um, thinking of time as just um, uh, a constellation, I think, as Benjamin said, of, of moments that are, that are constantly um, happening. And so in a way, technology time, lifetime, institution time, space time are all happening right now. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Jessica, Aria, do you have thoughts about this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, like, I'm really interested in that. I think that one of the, a few, there's a few ways into that that I've been really into, I think, recently. Like, Bergson is another great, like, thinker about time. And sort of that's, like, the sort of, with the column for me, he was really prominent in sort of thinking about that. Like, the idea of, like, non-pulsed and, like, non-linear time. Um, and, and going along with the Benjamin thing. I also think that there's, there's, like, this phrase, like, terrestrial consciousness that I think is pretty cool that I think like in terms of like how to be able to think like you know it's one thing to sort of be able to be like okay maybe these moments are all connected in this like constellation but how do you like really relate your your own subject position to that and I think this idea of terrestrial consciousness and sort of planetary scale um, view of what it is to be a subject or you know um, a living entity on the planet that can yeah like terrestrial rather than you know um, yeah, anthropocentric, I guess, uh, at, at its most basic level, I think is an interesting movement. And I think that like, a few people talk about that recently, I've been reading like um, Mbembe, and he's like, you know, thinking that way, um, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, you know, um, so we didn't talk very much tonight about um, the, the tree project um, that I've been working on, but you know, eventually, um, when I was, uh, as I've been working with these scientists and engineers that are um, focused on uh, space, building technology for space, and building communication systems um, to connect, you know, Earth with space, um, it has definitely framed technology and these short cycles of technology in a much longer actual material time span. Uh, because we're actually thinking about spacecrafts that could potentially operate for 200 years. Um, and then you, when you start thinking on that scale, you realize, oh, well, humans, you know, we're going to kind of come and go during that time period. You know, archivists and artists and scientists are going to come and go. And, and so then when you start to think about terrestrial time and, and time beyond uh, you know, our own consciousness. Um, that's when I started working with the idea that um, maybe we should build a communication system that uh, wraps in other species that have longer life cycles than us. And, um, you know, we started to talk about whales and coral and all of these different species that, uh, you know, live many human lifetimes and uh, decided that trees were at the cornerstone of our ecosystem and, and, um, could, could uh, act as um, the sort of stewards or storytellers about um, our planet in, in a longer time frame. Um, yeah. Wonderful. All right, next question is from Gretchen. Uh, she writes, Aria, I'm a huge fan of Rhizome's web recorder in seeking to archive, in my case, search engine performances. I'm really curious how you've seen it used within institutional archives or the exhibition of artwork. 
And to Julia, have you used this in your work? And to Jessica, have you used the web recorder? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, so um, it's interesting. I mean, I, so being on the curatorial side, I interface with web recorder stuff somewhat, but, um, and we did a big conference a few years ago that was about like the ethics of archiving the web that use that a lot. Um, I haven't really seen a lot of institutions using it actively, but also that could be because it might be happening behind closed doors in a more like research and archival oriented um, capacity. So I don't want to say that like no one's using it. I, I think a lot of people do use it, but I, I know that for us, um, we've used it a lot. Yeah, in that anthology, there are a few projects that do use Web Recorder as a tool for like the either in the research process or um, for ex exhibiting like, yeah, more like maybe performative or like platform based um, works. And that's something that we've, we've sort of identified as a, a great use case for it. Like, um, you know, artworks that take place within a platform and need to be, you know, archived in a feed within a feed or like, you know, things like, um, like we did a lot of stuff with like various like hashtag related um, Twitter activist like formations and stuff like that um, with the ethics and archiving the web conference. Um, but personally, I find that I find the most use, found the most use for it like archivally for my own research. Like I did a, I was doing a long project where I was writing an essay that um, involved a lot of like really like really minute back and forth across like a few different bloggers in the mid 2000s. And so I had to record like it wasn't like I, I it was I didn't need the post in isolation. Yeah, you know, it wasn't helpful to you know just lift quotes. I really wanted to be able to see like you know the dates and who spoke, said what when, and that there was a back and forth and like nested threads and that sort of thing. So um, I created an archive for that, and that was really useful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we see it a lot in like research capacities for sure. Um, Super. Yeah, I can oh, I, I can sort of talk about um, sort of the institutional what institutions are tending to do in that sort of area. We've got some time for it. Um, I feel I want to ask Ari more questions about that, but I'm thinking like, oh, time it. Maybe I'll send her an email later. So. Um, uh, what something that is more prevalently is used a little bit more for institutions, um, not necessarily institutional archives, but like, a, say, a university archive or something like that is the Internet Archive Service Archive it. Um, part of that, too, is a, is the difficulty of being able to preserve what you are archiving. So um, one of the things that we've kind of run into, and I think this um, t speaks to Aria talking about web art and sort of art that lives in a uh, technological context, is having the ability to preserve things in this sort of static state, the way that they were in time when they were created over the course of, of you know years. So if you've ever used the Wayback Machine, which is the way the Internet Archive presents historic um, websites, you'll see that there are quite a bit of like broken links, for example. Um, things that were dynamically generated onto websites that you can't see anymore. So in order to actually emulate that in the way that they were created can be very challenging. And on my side, it's not so like I feel like it's not so hard because a lot of time it's very in, it's informational. I almost prioritize that as a matter of um, practicality. But we do have a lot of art like I can't speak to the art specifically. I don't work with it, but there is a big challenge of trying to make the experience of that artwork um, stable over time and then there's also the I, th I think there might also be the um, additional difficulty of having some artists who are trying to sort of defeat time like time can't you know like we're trying to do at the museum we're constantly trying to like beat time we're trying to you know uh restore paintings to how they were at a certain point in time we're trying to keep things from decaying we you know things aren't allowed to um change and change is inevitable and it's um, it feels very unnatural and it feels very um, uh, I don't know it feels hopeless on days when you know you have low energy like you're not going to be able to do it um, but yeah part of it is just it's very and it's also just very labor intensive like to be able to just have the amount of space that we would need and to be able to have the expertise for example to do like web crawlers in order to see like you know um, in order to actually archive like you know where LACMA is being um, spoken about on the web and is that something that we want to do um and where and what voices do we prioritize when people are speaking about LACMA so that would be at LACMA but there are other ones too like um people who document um uh, political movements for example on the web is another example that is outside of the purview of 
what I do at the institution, but um, yeah, it can be very, it can be just very difficult and very resource intensive. Can I add something also about the writing thing? I realize that maybe not everyone knows what web recorder is. Um, web recorder is a tool where you can, yeah, you can create like archives of web pages. That's exactly what it sounds like. Um, but crucially, I think it's something that's useful about it is that you create live copies. So when you go back and you review use that, you go back to them, you can actually scroll the feed as it was and follow, like it, it, it goes deep into the architecture of whatever it is that you've saved. So that's really useful, especially for like popping things. And so um, that, yeah, I think that's a crucial, element of it and also in terms of like retaining the yeah performativity of the experience of it um and and allowing for especially with objects that are like you know jessica you mentioned the sort of like question of like the individual thing that you're trying to get save versus like the sort of larger complex of things and it kind of allows you to expand that i guess and then also one way that we use it is also like for instance there's this um william popel net art piece that we we uh, preserved and like it's just like incredibly like intricate labyrinth of like web pages that are all quite simple but a lot of them got like had broken links or like their things are missing and so we sp like I spent a lot of time just like clicking through like basically like scanning every page for like a possible link and then like clicking through and then figuring out if it worked or not and then like recording and something then we'd patch it in later and then basically had to like Frankenstein together this thing so yeah it's like uh, our, even with like something like web recorder it's labor intensive on the Rhizom side as well. Um, but yeah, it's interesting hearing like what every, and in every institution yeah, there's so yeah. much different stuff. It's like so interesting. It's so yeah. cool. And then, <laughs> and then there's going to be people who are like, well, is that still like a website? Cause it's not, you right. know, like, you know, and then, yeah. So, and different websites are going to have different, um, what's most, is the code important? What's the document? Is the document the performative experience, which feels right. more real to me, or is it the code? Um, but yeah, it's all, it's all really interesting. I think I feel like I like talking about it more than doing it. Doing it's hard talking <laughs> about it. Yeah, yeah. But, the yeah. philosophy yeah. of it is very exciting. And then you have to sit down and, and like, <laughs> stress out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to, I want to give a quick shout out to, to the media archaeology lab uh, at the university of Colorado in Boulder, mm -hmm. um, where I took, uh, you know, some, some ephemera that hadn't been accessed for a long time to um, see if I could get into it. Um, and the whole idea behind the mall, the media archaeology lab is um, to have just all of these generations of technology um, available, functioning with, um, you know, the hard drives associated with those machines and the media, et cetera, so that people can go in and see original documents um, using the environments in which they were created. So um, it's a great resource. Everybody should check it out. Super. Okay, um, I think we can squeeze in at least one more question. Uh, Oscar writes, Julia, you said in your talk that in trees you found your answer to technology time. Can you say more about that answer they offered you? Um, sure. Uh, I think that uh, basically, you know, this kind of relates to the first question that uh, we were asked at the beginning of the Q&A. Um, you know, how how do we bridge between these short cycles of time that define our daily lives um, to the longer sort of terrestrial um, time scales that um, are beyond us as individuals and potentially as a species, as a civilization, et cetera. And um, to me, it felt important to look at uh, other species that are around us that, um, you know, have a story uh, that is just as crucial to, you know, uh, our planet as our story. And, um, and trees were, became this uh, sort of way for me to bridge between uh, my own personal small time scale and uh, the larger time scale of the planet and of the cosmos. Um, trees, you know, record their daily lives on their rings, you know, it's like uh, the live feed of the earth is encoded within the rings of a uh, tree. And uh, so in their very bodies, they, um, they sort of bridge uh, these, these time scales. And uh, so they became very central for me in figuring out um, you know, if, if a tree can, can operate for this for hundreds of years and, um, 
and keep going. Uh, why aren't we making technology that functions uh, like a tree? You know, why, why are we making these things that have these short time scales rather than trying to think long term about the, um, the things that we build? Um, as a way of reducing, uh, you know, kind of the endless waste that uh, that we're producing in these short cycles of technology time. Excellent. Okay, and um, I think we have time for just one more. Uh, Russell writes in, what is the time we're operating in now? Is this COVID time? Uh, where we are disoriented from our spaces when we literally cannot get to those objects of time that you've collected? In what way do they exist in time at all? Totally, right? I mean, time is time is time, I guess. And um, yeah, it's all of the above. <laughs> Um, I mean, think of that Walter Benjamin where like jet state or whatever, like the time of like revolution over time of potential. I mean, I don't know that I don't think COVID time is inherently that, but I think that like, again, it is interesting thinking about, I mean, obviously we're just being become so present to the elasticity of time now and like kind of like, yeah, it's like sort of like, yeah, time that's sort of like potentiality mostly, not really like, um, but also being like sort of really super, super tethered to like a hyper present. I don't know. It, it feels like it's like, this paradox. But. Yeah. And losing track a little bit of linear time. You know, so many people have said to me, like, I can't keep track of what day it is or, you know, what I have coming up on my calendar um, because linear time has become really disorienting since we've been having this, uh, yeah, other relationship with time. Yeah, we've been um, at the museum trying, there's all of a sudden um, everything that everybody was working on, all the time scales for projects that were coming up in the summer and the fall, et cetera. Um, those all had to stop and then a very quick ramping up of different kinds of work to make um, the museum accessible in ways, in whatever ways we could. And then at the same time, um, there is uh, the need to capture this moment. So it's like a very weird, um, it's very weird, like we are very much like in the moment and then we're all under sort of the pressure of the stress of this uncertainty and of this sort of inherent danger. And then at the same time, like having to do the work of trying to remember it. And then also realizing like, you know, I know my brain is messed up right now. Like, how am I going to be able to do a good job of being the archivist and actually creating like, how do people create like um, reliable records of an experience so bizarre when at the same time you're experiencing the bizarre incident, it's extremely challenging. And I'm trying just to, um, I don't know, it's gonna be the accidental archive. That's, it's like what, whatever we have energy to provide is going to be what the future, what the future will be able to experience. That Super. might be true of any, any and all archives in, yes, at the end of the yes. day. Yes, yes, I think you're right, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, unfortunately, we are all out of time for our event. But um, I think before we go, Julia, you are going to read us out with a excerpt from your book. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to read? Yeah, so um, given that it's Earth Day, um, I thought uh, I would read a passage um, here towards the end of the book in the space-time section that um, is about, uh, about the planet, about the Earth. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'd like to thank uh, Julia and our panelists, Jessica Gambling and Arya Dean, for joining us. Thank you all. It's been a wonderful afternoon and evening. Uh, have a great night, and uh, thank you very much. Take care. Even if our human civilization falls apart and dies, the planet will thrive and evolve. Trees will likely be a part of that new earth. A long-term story about life on earth might not be a story of humanity, but we must accept the change we create and accept its burden. We must sharpen our ability to respond to and shape change. Butler's Olavina rings in my ear. Alter the speed or the direction of change. Vary the scope of change. Recombine the seeds of change. Transmute the impact of change. 
Seize change, use it, adapt, and grow. What will Earth become if humanity is ever interplanetary? Earth will still be here. Would we take our new planet's elements for granted? Would we, what would the ground feel like there? Will it be hard and cold? Will it be crawling with bugs that we can't tolerate? Will there be vegetation, seasons? As far as we've observed, there is nothing even remotely like Earth anywhere. Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Aurora, is about a multi-generational starship bound for an exoplanet, transporting a human community large enough to populate it. The ship carries with it Earth's ecosystem, dirt, microbes, atmosphere, and trees. We would probably only be able to dwell on another planet if we terraformed it first, making it into a version of Earth. After the challenge of transporting humans to another planet, the ultimate upgrade, comes the challenge of transporting the vast network of species that support humanity. This atmosphere, these animals, these pollen and spores, the geysers, the rivers, the plains of grass, these oceans, these mountains, this bacteria. Thank you so much for being here. Happy Earth Day. <laughs>